Aloha and welcome. This is Stephen Chudy coming to you from the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii. Today's webinar, Envisioning Project-Based Language Learning, uh, will uh, take place today and tomorrow, the 17th and 18th of January, for 90 minutes per day. The symposium is bringing together language educators, researchers, and innovators to explore the potential of project-based language learning to enhance and transform language education, and we'll provide you with an excellent introduction to this topic. Our first session today will be presented by Bob Lentz, who is Executive Director of the Buck Institute for Education. His topic is defining high-quality project-based learning, and if anyone should know about project-based learning, it's Bob Lentz. Uh, well, aloha, um, and uh, um, thank you for um, inviting me here to share with you the uh, framework for high-quality project-based learning uh, that the Buck Institute has been facilitating over <coughs> the creation over the last year. All right. Um, well, I'm uh, very excited to share with you a framework that is, uh, will be released um, uh, globally um, and officially in March, um, but you get to have an uh, early preview um, of, the, uh, of the work. And so we're excited to share this and um, have you interact with the, the, uh, the, the framework and the criteria. Um, I am going to so I'd like to start with and as you've been uh, instructed uh, to use the the um, uh, chat box um, but if uh, you could think and recall a transformative learning experience that you uh, that you can recall um, ideally in your K through 12 education uh, sometimes people have a hard time pulling pulling one of those memories out, um, and so if there's another transformative learning experience, but just take a minute to think about that and see if we can't get a few um, descriptions up here on our on our chat board. All right, here we go. Creating a film, studying abroad, actually dissecting a, a fish, learning a language with native speakers, preparing a first distance learning class, understanding the grammar of another language. We have, um, we can just keep them coming. I'm gonna, um, we're, for those joining, we're recalling transformative learning experiences. Um, as we ask this question all across the United States and across the world, we, we often hear a lot of the same um, language um, and experiences that involve um, deeper learning opportunities, um, hands on learning opportunities. Uh, a stretch um, uh, that's a challenge, um, often intellectual as well as um, uh, beyond that. Um, and there seems to be a lot of commonality um, and, and often linked to, um, well, maybe not a formal project based learning, but having some of the criteria of high quality projects. So, I'd also like to ask to recall a time when you've done a project either as a as a uh, as a as a student um, or possibly an assignment you've made that looks like what we call at the Buck Institute for Education more like a dessert project as opposed to a main course 
Um, some examples that we highlight in our training for teachers, because often these are called projects um, and they occur at the culmination of the learning and they're um, really not at stretching the kids uh, to recall or, or to work towards anything with inquiry or discovery or application. They're more, and, and they might or might not even be linked to the standards that you're in the discipline. And the, the left, uh, top left, you have the California Mission um, Project that fourth graders historically, this is changing in the state, um, have been asked to do um, for generations. Um, the one that you see there is a kit that was uh, purchased at Michael's uh, art supply store. Um, and so the, down below that in the solar system, a common project often in the study of, the, of uh, science of the of, of uh, uh, astronomy um, and asking kids basically to create a model of the solar system, which is really just a, a big model of, of recall. Um, in the right-hand corner uh, top is uh, the Alamo um, and the Longhouses. Um, so these type of projects that are um, out there are, are, are in, probably in, in, in conflict with the, and, and not aligned with the, the transformative learning experiences that you were calling before. Um, and as we have seen, um, uh, project-based learning uh, grow significantly, uh, us and, and others across the country and across the globe were really worried that um, it's a great, a great opportunity to, to see projects grow and at the same time some fear that it could be growing in the way of, of mission projects um, and, not, and not truly transformative learning experiences. So we were um, partnered with two foundations, the Project Management Institute Education Foundation um, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation to facilitate a process with um, education experts and practitioners across the country and across the world. Um, we gathered last uh, January a steering committee of of uh, 25 um, uh, experts in project-based learning, seven of them from different countries, folks from teachers to school leaders to um, support providers and professional development, academics, uh, uh, policy makers, um, to come together to think about what would a framework for high-quality project-based learning look like that can help guide the field. Um, Julio Rodriguez uh, from the uh, Language Institute um, is, is part of that steering committee um, there in Hawaii. We, we also um, put together over 80 advisors um, who weighed in and gave us feedback um, we, uh, on, the, on the framework as it was developed. And we um, shared the framework last spring and summer with thousands of educators across the across the country, um, and opened up uh, an online portal for feedback. To received over three thousand pieces of sing individual pieces of advice. Half of that coming from educators and interested parties from uh, from outside the United States. Um, and with that, we were able to um, may, uh, take that feedback on the on the draft that was. Uh, co-designed with the steering committee and come out with the, the final documents that we'll be launching in March so you get the preview. What we found was that we had some pretty broad agreement within the steering committee and advisors and, and, and practitioners all across the world um, is oh, why we do project-based learning, that the world's changed dramatically, um, schools haven't, uh, the academic uh, and success skills and outcomes that students need is critical uh, beyond just um, uh, the traditional uh, recall of information. And it's especially true in the sense of equity for students who are furthest from opportunity. So we had broad agreement of why. We also found that 
uh, the work of the Buck Institute for Education on how you design and facilitate high quality project based learning and other networks um, like New Tech, which the network, which is part of it, or High Tech High or Expeditionary Learning, or universities like the University of Hawaii have um, tools and products and services uh, that uh, provide the, the how to help teachers and ultimately leaders put the conditions in place so that students can do high quality project-based learning. What we came to agreement what was missing is what does high quality project-based learning look like for students? And so what I'm gonna share with you today is a framework of six criteria um, with a set of guiding questions that can help us uh, together as a, as, as a field of educators committed towards transformative learning experiences to getting kids both the academic and success skills they need, um, what it looks like when students are uh, engaged in that. Um, and then um, well, it, it becomes the accountability and the responsibility of us as educators to figure out how we design and facilitate those learning experiences so kids experience PBL. So what we're gonna share and I'm going to share on behalf of the, the steering committee is the what. The first of the uh, criteria is, um, uh, and, and purposely first, because it's one of the things that we see often missing in projects that we wouldn't consider high quality, um, is the intellectual challenge and accomplishment that students are learning deeply, thinking critically, and striving for excellence. Um, and it really asks us to, to, to what extent are students investigating challenging questions, that this work is a, over time, that they're focused on concepts and knowledge and skills within the intellectual discipline or subject area. And really importantly, that we see students recognizing and striving for high quality work. Um, Remembering that this is the what, not the how, often assessment is built into this, both in the challenge and the sense of accomplishment and giving kids feedback early and often along the way as to how they get to high quality work. That the work is authentic. Um, authenticity is a key criteria. Um, that students work on projects that are meaningful and relevant to their culture, their lives, and the future. Do we see that this is often where we hear about the real world nature of project-based learning? Um, also that there, because uh, of the design principle of voice and choice, that students find that they're able to engage within their own personal interest um, and connect things to their culture so that project-based learning, when done well, uh, is, is a culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, that students are using tools and techniques and technologies um, and assessments that are used in the world beyond school. Um, often this is where we see it's clear that the, the technology being used as a tool. Um, and there's, there, we always see some range of choice for kids that builds a sense of authenticity. Um, tightly linked to the authenticity is the public nature of the work, that the work is seen by their peers and people beyond the classroom. And there's a growing research, uh, especially out of the University of Michigan, uh, Nell Duke, that's showing that students um, produce higher quality work when they know that they're working for an audience beyond the classroom, beyond the teacher. Um, and the work is public in the classroom as well because students are reviewing and critiquing their work using the rubrics and other tools. They're getting feedback about the quality of their work and guidance from mentors and experts beyond the classroom. Um, and that could be online or in person. And they're exhibiting their work and discussing their learning with people beyond the classroom. Uh, to what extent the kids do this? And we really see all of these uh, criteria as a continuum um that they're all present um in a high quality project but to certain degrees and um, public product is one um where we think there is a wide continuum from presentations that happen in a classroom with visitors coming in or in the school 
to students doing work out in the community and their audience and the presentations and the products being real, uh, really put to use um, and making a difference in their communities. The work is collaborative. The collaboration is key. Now, um, notice the tagline here that students collaborate with other students in their class, their school, or online, and may work with adults who serve as project mentors and audiences. We believe, and we had agreement across the, the, the steering committee and with advisors, that you, the project-based learning is collaborative, that often you work in a team to complete a complex task. But not all high quality projects are group projects. But all high quality projects involve kids to some extent collaborating. So they might be working in a team and being a team leader or a member, but they also might learn how to work with adult experts or community members and businesses and organizations by sharing their work and getting feedback that way. Um, it also in the nature of the review and critique that comes with the public product, um, is an, also another avenue for kids to collaborate. But we wanted to be really clear that project-based learning is a great opportunity for kids to learn, to work in teams, to take leadership, and it's, um, but it's not all group projects are group projects, um, but they all involve some level of collaboration. Project management, that students are learning to, through a project and they're learning how to manage a project. And it's actually defined um, and it provides structure for the project. Um, we often hear about how teachers are managing activities. That's what teachers do. We ultimately wanna see kids managing their own projects. They work as independently as possible. That might look different in a kindergarten classroom than it does in a, in, in a senior in high school. Um, where hopefully by the time they're in seniors, they're really managing themselves in their project. And they understand and can use project management or design thinking processes uh, and tools and strategies. And they use a design and, and use uh, other frameworks like design thinking where appropriate to, to solve problems. Um, we think this idea that, uh, that of, of collaboration and project management um, are really clear that we're working to learn these skills individually, even in the process of working in a team. Is uh, one of my favorite um, mantras is that kids don't go to college to and 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 go through their four years in a group, uh, or take a new job after call uh, after high school and and have it and have that be a group their 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 salary be a group salary. We, we have individual responsibilities in, in our learning through our post-secondary. Um, and so while kids are in a project-based experience, they should both have the collaboration to be able to be a great team member, but also know how to learn and manage their learning as an individual. And finally, reflection. That students reflect on their learning throughout the project. Um, they write about it, they discuss it, and they're, all, they're, they're reflecting both on academic concepts and on success skills like collaboration and critical thinking. Um, and they really use it as a tool to increase their own personal agency. Um, it's, it's all projects include all six of these. As I said, there's a continuum. And really, as we, um, we're, we're fine tuning this, we're most likely gonna change the two students to to what extent do students um, uh, reflect? And so because we think that all need to be present, but as a continuum of growth of teachers, they might uh, be working into developing deeper and more comprehensive experiences in any of these criteria over time. What I thought I'd do is share my screen. I, I'm hoping this is gonna work uh, for you to actually see what it looks, uh, these criteria look like. And, See if we can use the, the chat the chat box again. Um, I'm going to show you a video from a third grade uh, project in uh, San Jose, California. The school called Catherine Smith. Uh, their demographics are uh, predominantly um, Latino um, and um, with a with a, also a strong uh, large contingency of. Um, Vietnamese and other South East, South, Southeast Asian um, families. 
Um, and most of the students are qualified for pre and reduced lunch. Um, the, uh, and what I'd ask you to do is to look um, for examples um, while you're watching the video of the criteria of intellectual challenge and accomplishment, authenticity, public product, collaboration, project management, and reflection. Um, and that's what I'll be asking you to, to share on the chat box is any of the um, uh, evidence that you, that you saw. Would you like to have your own room? Yeah. Would you like to have your own space? Yeah. The driving question was, how can we as a design team design a house for clients taking into consideration budget and location and personal preferences? The entry event was Minecraft. So they used Minecraft to build just a house that they would build for their family. This is inside the house. This is where, I, like, the sofa, and over here is where I sleep. They're able to use their creativity. They're able to just be free and just to build without anybody giving them parameters. Back to our project and this driving question. What do we need to know to answer this question? Like, say they have family that's going to come live with them. They have to think about that. The Minecraft building sparked like, how many rooms do we build? And so they came up with their need to knows. Any other need to knows you'd like to add? Not to imagine how much it costs. Well, we have to know like how many kids are or how big the family is. And what are those questions that you think you should ask the client? And they're like, yeah. And so we come back to the driving question. We came back to the need to knows. And we came back to their entry event just so that they can get some questions that are appropriate for the project to their clients. What is the minimum square footage you want? Uh, 400. Do you want a second story? Yes, second story would be good. Okay. Okay, yeah, that'd be cool. I think it's important for them to know that there's a real client because it gives the project more authenticity. Would you like to have a garden outside your house? Yes. When they form a relationship with the client, then they start to care about what the client thinks. This is the final product. This is what the construction documents look like. But not too different from that concept drive, right? We have the bedrooms up here, master bedroom in the corner. So I asked an expert to come and present to the students, and he was actually a structural engineer. And to see elevations, just kind of look at what kind of information is on there. How do you tell a wall is a wall? You can see you put two lines parallel to one another. And we talked about making blueprints and what does that look like or having a layout. Okay, it even, it even has to These are called elevations. I think they were really excited about seeing the blueprints because it was just real things that they can hold, they can touch, and they can see, and they know that engineers touched it and any engineers made this, and this is what we're going to do. <laughs> All right, we're going to move into our next rotation. On this side, we have front row and rest kids for listening to reading and answering comprehension questions. So as we plan the project, we think about the standards that we're going to be using. In this project, we're using opinion writing or reading of informational text, and we integrate that into like a daily rotation of in English language arts. So this is an article from NASA and it's called Tiny House Fun. If you have something you want to highlight, like you want to get back to, or a word that you really don't understand and you want to learn more about that, you can highlight some words. So on that day, I had a group and we were looking at informational reading. And then another group, they were listening to a book that had to do with houses. And then another group was working on vocabulary and all the vocabulary is part of the project. And then another group was just doing their read to self and that's just books that they're interested in. So they're practicing reading independently. Write your name at the top. For math rotations, we call it math with the teacher, math with technology and math with the partner. The house size that your client wanted. And then I'm working with the group and we're really looking at area and perimeter and the difference between area and perimeter. Okay, so can you tell me what the square units are here? Another activity that we did with math was the Cheez-Its map. When they looked at square footage, we said that each Cheez-Its was one square inch and they used that kind of information to do square footage within the house. 
it was just kind of a connection for them. To help them refine their designs of their homes, they students went through a feedback protocol. I turned the bathtub from here to here because I know that you can't get the toilet. There's the bathroom with the shower. They were paired up with another group and they presented their models, they presented their blueprints and their layout and they talked about what was in the house and how, and who their client was just to get some feedback from their peers. Our client is Miss Pena. Her age is 39. Her budget is $40,000. Within the fishbowl protocol what we did was me and another teacher we sat in front of a presenting group and everyone else looked around us, just like a fishbowl where they're not to talk, they're not to say anything, they're just really listening and seeing the interaction between the presenter and the, and the guest. I like how you do go into the living room, but maybe push the bedroom in the back. And then, so then that way she has more privacy. And the purpose of looking at that interaction between the audience and the presenter is so you can think about questions, you can think about behavior within the meeting, and so they can use that as the model for when they go back to their groups. This is the laundry area, and then here's the pantry to store all the clothes. Right here we have a little office. We practice different ways to present to their clients. We talk about eye contact, we talk about confidence, we talk about postures, we talk about volume of your voice. Hello, my name is America. Hello, my name is Christopher. And the title of our project is Tiny Houses. Our driving question of this project is, given a budget, how can we, as a design team, plan a home for a family? The last day of this journey is for them to really present their work to their clients. And they were so excited. Did you have a hard time building the house? Kind of, yeah. We had to redo some of the walls so that they were the exact measurement. There's a master bedroom. The middle is a kitchen. Here's a, a room. They shared their blueprints. They shared their layout. They shared their budget. And they shared their opinion paragraphs that they wrote so that they can try to persuade their client to purchase their home. Love to get a few comments here about um, evidence and connection that people saw um, on or, or questions that you have about how the criteria became present uh, for the experience. You saw the kids experiencing um, these uh, these criteria. There was a question about Minecraft at the beginning. Um, the the Minecraft was uh, was an experience of what we call in a project based learning the launch, uh, the hook, um, so that you could see the kids getting um, excited about the project before it's even inter introduced to them. Um, so uh, and I see some questions about some comments like STEM based and skills and confidence building. So I. I I think we saw like the, the, the clear intellectual challenge in the kids uh, through the feedback loops and the pieces of work that you saw. You had um, uh, really high quality projects. The com comments about the technology integration and seeing that as a, you're really using technology like a structural engineer and creating uh, binds and then integrating their math on, on perimeter and, and area. Um, we know, I noticed people commenting about the collaboration, uh, the sense of project management that the kids were working towards. The clients were not real uh, in the real sense, but the kids still felt a lot of uh, realness to that. Um, so the, uh, and I, I like this project because it shows you the sense of being public uh, with it in a really manageable way for the teachers. The kids knew that they were creating this for their clients, um, uh, but they didn't have to go out of the classroom in order to do it. Um, the fishbowl uh, was a great uh, example that we see up there that, that showed um, both a public product as well as reflection. 
um, because the students had to go and take that feedback and reflect on it and, and incorporate it into their new uh, piece. Um, uh, and I love the comment just there that the project meets all the criteria listed, yet it seems to seems possible to re to realize. And so I think as we think about high quality project based learning, I think sometimes we have, if you've ever seen uh, Most Likely to Succeed, which is a great film and inspiring, but the big giant wheel that they create, that's, that's what we all need to be striving for. And I think this is a great project example that shows you kids really having a deep experience, integrated skills based instruction. Um, that is highly engaging and they're producing and they're stretched intellectually and creating really quality work. Um, and yes, the, the fishbowl is a scaffolding dress rehearsal. Uh, this project was about six to nine weeks. Um, so um, uh, I'm gonna check in with my other panelists. Um, I have another film to show, but I also know that you wanted me to make time for Q and A, and I, my understanding is I have till um, a quarter, three quarters past the hour. Um, That's correct, Bob. Um, I think another film might be a good idea um, to sort of widen our our base of experience. I think everyone understood what they saw in the video and were very interested to see how it met all the criteria and so forth. There is one outstanding question that it might be important for you to answer, and that is, do you have examples where the classroom contains more students, say 30 students, which is the case in many public classrooms? Uh, we do. Um, in the next video I'm gonna show you, there's, uh, there's more than 30. Um, it's a, but it's, in this case, it's a high school classroom. All right, let's do it. We are doing some important work today to get ready for the mock trial. We're going to start by building our criteria for effective revolutions. The entire project is deciding whether or not your revolution was effective. So we got to figure out what that means. What does it mean for a revolution to be effective? This is my revolutions project where students put a revolution on trial for its effectiveness in helping the citizens of the country. The driving question was how can we as lawyers determine the effectiveness of a revolution. Use that functional means clear decision making, a balance of power, reasonable laws and fair justice, and that your society is self-sustaining. What do you currently have? What do you need? Talk about it. The entry event for this project is one of my favorites. It's a week-long simulation where students are put into a society that is incredibly unfair and dysfunctional and are asked to create a fair and functional society. For the salary thing, we decided to change that. The peasants will be paid three dollars. So you're saying that you're taking taxes from everyone, right? A dollar? Yeah. Well, we earn a dollar, so... Like, so they're put in different social classes where they have different jobs and roles and very different rates of pay and privileges. And then throughout the simulation, they then on their own have to create what they think is a fair and functional society. After we've learned kind of the basic framework of how revolutions work and why they start, they learn about the conditions, beliefs, and triggers that start revolutions. The conditions were like, oh, um, people who like people are immigrants and they're like being thrown out of the US. Mm -hmm. And they start to do some research into the revolution of their choice. So they chose a revolution that they were interested in and I put them in groups, and then they start to get some background knowledge about that revolution. You might be more confused now than you were before you read it. That's okay. We're just trying to build our background knowledge and figure out what was going on in this revolution using these primary sources. Five minutes of academic conversation, and go. He was the general, so like he was a pirate, right? And he was against Madero, and so what he did is he joined like Pancho Villa and then and he used his power to overthrow the president and basically the whole government, right? So they look into some secondary sources that kind of summarize the whole revolution, and then they start to get more in-depth into some primary sources, so witness accounts, speeches by the revolutionary leaders, and that's before they know if they're defending or prosecuting the revolution. So it's kind of getting the whole picture of what happened before I assign them aside. Okay, you guys are going to be defending the Cuban Revolution and saying it did help the people. 
You guys are going to be prosecuting the Cuban revolution and saying it did not help oh, yeah. the people. As soon as I assign them a side in the revolution, they then know who their mock trial teams are going to be. The revolution wasn't effective because it didn't make fair laws. I just want you guys to take into consideration our nation was in poverty and all the people that couldn't afford to support themselves have to work and they weren't getting paid the amount they needed to buy food. It says the slaves who came like enter nationally territory and they got like the act with them so they were able to like live freely. Does that sound like a fair laws and government and people being benefited? No. If you're in civil war for 10 years? No. So as a team, they look through all of the evidence that they've found throughout their research and they start to identify what are the strongest pieces of evidence that will support their side. And then they use that evidence to create their argument. And then they use that argument to begin to build their case. Che Guevara once said, true revolutionaries are guided by feelings of great love. What do you think that quote means? What does this tell you about how he felt about revolutions and their leaders? Based on what you know about revolutions, do you agree with that quote? Two minutes to silently read and write, go. So throughout the project, I focus a lot on the common core standards of reading and writing. The biggest writing standards for the 10th grade are around argumentation and their argumentative writing. So creating a strong argument that they can support with evidence. They do that in their timed writing that we do about midway through the project and then also in the actual mock trials. So it's all about creating a strong argument that they can support with relevant evidence. Your Honor, people of the jury, in 1959, the Cuban Revolution, led by Fidel Castro, overthrew President Batista and went on to change the history of Cuba. As soon as they finished the timed writing, where I made sure that they understood the revolution and their side, I then showed them the structure of the trials. So we looked at a whole bunch of videos of trials from movies and some student mock trials from other schools so they could see what do lawyers do, how do lawyers act, how do witnesses act when they're on the witness stand. You were there, I assume you saw many horrendous things. They also interviewed some actual lawyers on FaceTime to talk about what do you do to prepare for a case, what do the different parts of a trial look like, and then I gave them an outline that showed the whole parts of the trial. From there, they then decided as a group who they thought their strongest lawyers would be and witnesses, and they decided on those roles on their own. What differences do you see before and after the revolution? Like before we couldn't even get married without permission. And then we started practicing. They practiced first just within their own team to get some feedback. And then we did some fishbowl practicing where they practiced for another team. And the person who had their same role but on a different revolution gave them feedback using the rubric that they had created as a class. Court is now in session. We'll begin with the trial of the Haitian Revolution in which we will be considering the case of was the Haitian Revolution guilty or innocent of harming its people? The Haitian Revolution is the only successful slave revolution in history. It's also the first black independent state. And how would you say the conditions of the economy was after the revolution? I felt that the economy is worsening because of the law. So in the final presentation, they got up on the stage in our community room. The prosecution was on one side and the defense on the other. We had an audience of another class from our school and another teacher that helped me make up the jury. They started with their opening statements on each side. I then swore in the witnesses and they began their questioning. So each side questioned their own witnesses and then they had a cross-examination. And then they ended with the closing arguments for each team before the jury announced the verdict. We're free, resilient. We have power for ourselves, we have rights. One of the biggest benefits to having students learn about revolutions through a mock trial is that it forces them to see both sides of the issue. And I think that traditionally when you learn about something, there's always bias involved, but when they have to argue the other side or respond to arguments about the other side, they see that revolutions affect different people in different ways. So it kind of forces teenagers that don't often see other people's perspectives to see an issue from both sides and realize how complicated things are. In the just a few minutes remaining,
interesting. Uh, it seems like uh, people are really interested in viewing that video, uh, but it may not be public. Uh, so maybe you could comment on that. Yes, uh, it's not public yet. Um, it'll most likely come public this uh, fall. Uh, it's part of a, a new book that we will be um, releasing with ASCD called Project Based Learning Teaching. So in, in addition to these overviews of the project, uh, we actually have smaller snippets of actual, um, more of the actual um, instructional strategies sort of uh, highlighted um, as, as we uh, tell the stories and highlight the, the, uh, the teaching strategies in the new book. Um, it's a big uh, focus of ours as we we spent a lot of our work previous, previously and we still think it's important on the how to have high quality design and we have our gold standard for design. Um, but the gold standard for teaching elements and the instructional strategies are, um, are, are critical. So, Thank you, Bob. Well, um, there's one other uh, question. Between the two projects that you uh, showed us, we see a difference. Uh, the, the younger kids who are designing houses are creating them for clients. Now those clients are mock clients. They're not really going to buy those houses. But in the trial, uh, the second project, it's not, we're not in a courtroom. They're not uh, in the world at large conducting this. So can you speak to the authenticity of those two projects? Also the student voice and choice in the second project? Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the reasons I like showing this, the 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 mock trial project is, as I had mentioned before, there's a continuum of these criteria. Um, and so we would say that that what are the, and the mock trial, it was probably the low, one of the lowest levels of public product, but it still moved outside the classroom. So there was another teacher, um, there were other classroom, uh, there were other classmates that weren't in that class. Um, so the, the students knew that there, it was beyond their, um, their classroom. If you wanted to cut across the continuum, then yes, I would say like move it to the courthouse. Um, uh, involve a panel of, of lawyers, maybe as the, the judges. Um, there's all kinds of way to move it into more of a deeper public nature and probably for kids to feel the authenticity. Um, I think the, there was a sense of authenticity and the sense of the real world nature in, the, in that project because of the opportunity for the or requirement of the kids to interview um, attorneys. She mentioned they, they Facebooked uh, attorneys. Um, and there was also some um, uh, uh, opportunities to really understand the trial process. The student voice and choice came from which revolution they chose to study. Um, so uh, all on a continuum, but we would say that all, all in place. And I think us, we, we're now really trying to highlight some challenging yet attainable projects that, uh, that feel like in the grasp of teachers um, and schools that are moving into PBL and want to make sure they give a high quality experience. Um, I hope you saw in that project, while some of the things could move across, one, one that was there was a high extent of kids engaged um, intellectually and really using secondary and primary sources and having to synthesize and, and communicate there and defend, you know, and use evidence to defend an opinion. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's time for us to say goodbye to you, but before you go, could you offer us one final comment on your view of applying principles of PBL in the world languages domain? What are some of the particular challenges that you see? Well, I think, you know, um, moving with beginning, uh, and there's a question here about beginning world language learners. Um, I think as you're trying to work to figure out how to get the students to access and use and start to practice the language, um, en engagement um, and the authenticity might be a real way to, to, to figure that out. Um, and I've been very impressed and I, and, and I hope that there'll be an opportunity through these seminars that the 
teachers joining will have a chance to look at the resources and the project units that uh, the, you all have, have created at the, at the Language Learning Institute. Um, I've been sharing them. I think that um, many of them hit the, the criteria quite well um, and give really solid examples that teachers can use. Um, so I encourage folks to, to both look at the examples that have been created um, and also as they design their instruction to start to think about how this criteria can be, um, be used so that students have that type of experience when they're learning a language as well. Thanks, Bob. Thanks very much for presenting for us today.